to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Bible says in 1 John 1 verse 7 that if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of His Son Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The Word of God clearly teaches that in Christ, Christians have fellowship. But what is fellowship? That's a word we hear a lot, but are we familiar with the biblical idea of fellowship? We hope that you'll get your Bible and stay tuned as we're going to study today the wonderful subject of fellowship in Christ. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. What exactly is the word fellowship all about? What does it mean? What do we mean when Christians say we have fellowship? What exactly are we talking about? The word fellowship carries these ideas with it. It carries with it the idea of a partnership, that we are partners together in a joint venture and that we are striving for a common goal. It carries with it the idea of participation. To be in fellowship, I've got to participate in something. I've got to be an active part in that. It carries a, the idea of a joint effort. Some two people, somebody working together with you in an effort that you both believe strongly in. You know, the word fellowship, especially as you look at the meaning in the New Testament, carries the idea of sharing. Fellowship means that we share together, that we get along and that we work toward that common goal. Another word that's often used is the word communion. In fact, the Greek word for fellowship is the word koinonia, which means in itself communion or sharing in common. From the word, It comes from the Greek word koinos, which means common. And so when we talk about fellowship, we've got communion. We've got something in common that we're striving for and that we're trying every day to reach as our goal, ultimately to glorify God and to get to heaven itself. Now, today we're going to think about what the Bible says on the subject of fellowship. What can Christians know about their joint venture to together about their fellowship with God and about the things we must not fellowship in this life. Let's begin by noticing some things that we shouldn't fellowship. In the Bible, we are told not to have something in common with these things. First, God himself cannot fellowship evil. The God who I serve, the God who you serve, cannot be in a joint venture or a joint effort with evil. He has nothing 
in common with evil. Listen to what the psalmist said in Psalm 94, verse number 20. The Word of God records, Shall the throne of iniquity, which devises evil by law, have fellowship with you? Well, of course, the answer is no. That throne which promotes sin, promotes ungodliness, can have no fellowship with the God who is right and holy and true. Reminds us of the words of Habakkuk chapter 1, verse number 13. It is said of God, You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? God himself can't even look at. It's repulsive to it. It's abhorrent to his character. And so as we think about that which God himself can't fellowship, friends, we also need to realize that Christians can't have fellowship with evil. If something is contrary to God's character, if something is contrary to the word and will of God, if it is an immoral practice, an action, something that God clearly teaches in Scripture is wrong, whatever that may be, Christians need to make sure if God doesn't fellowship with it, if He doesn't have anything in common with it, neither should we. But you know what's unique about the New Testament? One of the things that we clearly learn that is so unique to our fellowship is the basis on which that occurs. Christians have fellowship based on the principles of New Testament fellowship. What do we mean by that? I want to direct your attention to a passage in the book of Acts. I'd like for you to look with me in Acts chapter 2, verse number 42, as we see the basis for our fellowship now and Christians' fellowship in the first century. The Bible says these words, And they, that is first century Christians, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Where, what is it that we have in common as Christians? The teaching of Christ. We have the, the life of Christ in common, that that life was the most stellar, amazing life anyone's ever lived. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. We have the, the teaching of Christ about the love of God. God so loved the world He gave. We have His teaching about salvation from sin, that whoever obeys the gospel has been freed from sin. Acts 2 verse 38. And we now live with a purpose in life to glorify God. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14. And so part of what we have in common is the doctrine, the teaching, the Word of God, which is that common bond of the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 4. You know, we also, as we think about the basis and what we have in common with first century Christians in our fellowship, not only do we have in common the apostles' doctrine, we also have in common the breaking of bread and prayer representative of Christians coming together on the first day of the week. What is it we have in common with other Christians? Friend, we gather together every first day of the week. Acts 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2, to worship God, to remember the Lord's sacrifice, and to honor Almighty God by our lips, by our actions, and with the things that God has commanded in the Bible. When we pray, we have fellowship. We pray in unison. We pray in the Spirit and understanding. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. And as we bow together in prayer, we have fellowship one with another as we approach the throne of Almighty God. And so Christians have as their basis of fellowship the doctrine, the worship, and the actions that we see of first century Christians in the New Testament. Now, let me mention a couple of other items that re relate directly to Christian fellowship, one of the ways that we fellowship with one another is through giving. As we give ourselves and as we give financially, we are fellowshipping God and fellowshipping with other Christians. Notice these passages with me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 4, Paul is going to discuss the idea of giving and how that is critical to our fellowship. Notice what he says in this text. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 4, the Bible records these words. Paul says, The uh, Macedonians were imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift 
and the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. They're, they're giving to that cause. They're helping the Apostle Paul to spread the gospel. That, that gift they gave was a fellowship. What does that mean? They had a common interest. They had a joint venture as we give to spread the gospel. Aren't we in fellowship with one another in the greatest cause ever? Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 13 on this subject. The Bible says these words, While through the proof of this ministry they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ, now listen, and for your liberal sharing with them and with all. That word sharing there carries the idea of fellowship. Their liberal giving to the spreading of the gospel to help other souls hear the message, that was a fellowship they had. Friend, here's how that relates to us today. Do we not believe that the gospel is what saves people's souls today? Do, do we not all have that common idea that men and women across the globe who've never heard of Jesus need to hear the message? And aren't we willing to, to give financially and of ourselves to see that venture take place? Then if so, we have fellowship in that. We're tied together, uniquely tied together, that we believe soul saving is so powerful that we want to support the spread of the gospel around the world. And so one of the ways we're in fellowship is when we give to, sp to spread the preaching of God's word around the world. You know, another way that Christians are in fellowship is with God and His Son and in the relationship that we have. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 9. The Apostle Paul says, God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We have that closeness. We have that common bond. We have that relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And anyone who has obeyed the gospel, Christians have that in common. We are all sons and daughters of God. And because of that, there is that bond. There is that sharing. We share. We have in common the same Father. We have in common the same Savior. We have in common the same plan of salvation that saved us all. And we have in common the forgiveness of sins and the fact that we're a part of the family of God. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above you all and through you all and in you all. Paul would say in Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6, we share that together. And friend, what a wonderful fellowship we have with one another through those beautiful ideas in and of themselves. And so we want to promote that closeness. We want to grow closer to each other and closer to God as we study, as we pray, and as we strive to do the things that God Himself wants us to do. Now, let's think about another aspect related to Christians and fellowship. One of the things the Bible clearly teaches is that Christians should not fellowship anything in the realm of sin. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 20, we're not going to fellowship Satan or sin or ungodliness. God says in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14, don't be unequally yoked together. Come out from among them. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 17. And listen to the clear words of Ephesians 5 verse 11. Here's the idea of fellowship. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, expose them. What else do Christians have in common? We have in common the fact that we strive to avoid sin and that we strive not to have fellowship with it. Now, I understand that all of us make mistakes. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 23. But as a general rule, we're striving to live a life free of sin. We're striving to separate ourselves from sin. And friend, anybody who's striving together in that venture to avoid sin and keep our lives out of the realm of sin ought to encourage and help and pick one another up if we have that in common. And friend, we need to have fellowship in the fact that we want to avoid sin in our life. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, we want to expose those. We want to let known by our lifestyle 
that which is contrary to the word and will of our God. And so what an important aspect in our fellowship that we have together. Another unique area that Christians have fellowship is with the Holy Spirit. The Bible in two passages makes it clear that we are in fellowship with the Spirit of God as well. Notice what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion, that's the word for fellowship, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We have communion or fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Notice another passage. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, Paul will say, strive to be close and be one with one another. You know, as we think about these two passages, communion of the Holy Spirit and fellowship of the Spirit, there's no denying that we have that closeness, that we have something in common, a joint sharing together. Well, what is it? Remember, we're not saying that this is something mystical, this is something magical, that this is something miraculous in that sense. What is what the communion or the fellowship we have with the Spirit of God? Friend, the Spirit has inspired the Word of God. The Holy Spirit inspired this. Second Peter 1, verses 19 through 21. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Spirit. John 16, verse 13. Jesus made the promise to first century disciples. When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He'll guide you into all truth. These words are the words of the Holy Spirit of God who inspired the book. As I read the Bible, as I study the Word of God, as I put its principles into practice in my life, as I walk in the light, 1 John 1 verse 7, as I strive to live according to the teaching of Christ, I'm in direct communion with the Spirit of God through the message He inspired. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3 verse number 16. And so please don't think we're saying that this is something you know, miraculous or mystical or magical in that sense, but isn't it wonderful to know we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit of God as we study the Spirit-inspired Word, as we try, try to live a life that is guided by the Spirit's teaching, as we try to produce the fruit of the Spirit in our life every day, we have that in common with the Holy Spirit who inspired that Word, who put that principle into practice, or who put that principle into revelation and gave us the knowledge of God's revealed will. Now, as we think about this idea of fellowship, let's also realize another principle that is so important to Christian fellowship. And friend, this is sometimes one that we have to work on. Here's what we learn from Scripture. Regardless of the past, whatever has happened in the past, regardless of that, Christians must extend fellowship to the faithful. Regardless of what that person's done, regardless of how They've lived their life regardless of the things that they may have done before coming into Christ. I've got the obligation to extend fellowship to them if they're faithful in the Lord. Listen to Galatians chapter 2, verse number 9. The Bible says, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles, and they to the circumcised. Now, for James, Cephas, and John, do you think that was easy for them to extend that hand of fellowship to Paul? Well, they probably wondered what it would cost them at one point. They knew it would cost them at one point for sure. Paul, who had formerly been Saul, was a murderer of Christians. He was holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen. He was wreaking havoc on the church, Acts chapter 7, uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 1. He was dragging men and women into prison. He was set with official documents from the high priest to find any who are of the way. And some of those might even lose their lives. Paul was a persecutor. Now you talk about a man it might have been hard to extend fellowship to. But regardless of the past, forgetting those things which are behind, Paul would say, 
reaching forward those things which are ahead. Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14, Paul said, I press on. If Paul was a faithful child of God, then Cephas and Je Peter, James, and John were under obligation by God to fellowship him. And friend, the same is true for us. You know, don't we all have a past? Haven't you and haven't I done things that are bad probably in our past life that are at least sinful? We've probably said things. We've probably been involved in things, things that we're now ashamed of. And yet, aren't you thankful that someone extended fellowship in Christ to you? And so regardless of that person's life, that person could have been a prostitute before. That person could have been a murderer before. That person may have been a drunk or a thief or whatever. But if by their life you can see they've obeyed the gospel, they're living for Christ, and they have put the past behind them, then, friend, our obligation is to fellowship them. Our obligation is to try to encourage them. Does that mean I'm going to go to the life of blinders on? That's not what we're saying. But, friend, we sure ought to do everything we can to be in fellowship with those who are faithful in Christ and those who are trying to live according to the will of Almighty God. Now, as we think about fellowship, there is a, a key to making fellowship happen. And, friend, that is this, fellowship is based on obedience to Christ and His plan of salvation. I want you to listen to Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 9. Paul says, And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. What is it? Which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. What is this fellowship that's been hidden from the ages, the mystery of the fellowship? Well, as you study the word mystery in the book of Ephesians, you find that it's, it's not something you really can't know, but something that at one point was hidden and now has been revealed. That in Christ, both Jew and Gentile now can be one. Ephesians 2, verses 14 through 16. Their fellowship in the first century was based, was based on obedience to Christ and the plan of salvation. And friend, the same is true for children of God today. Our fellowship is predicated upon obedience to Christ. Can I be in fellowship with someone in a spiritual sense who's never obeyed the gospel? Do I have something in common with someone spiritually who's never put on the Lord Jesus Christ, not spiritually? If they're not in Christ, they've not made that their goal. They've not made that their priority. They're not living the way God wants them to live. And so it's impossible to be in fellowship with someone who's yet to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Obedience is essential. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. Jesus said, it's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus clearly taught He is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. If someone has not obeyed Christ, if they're not in Christ, if they have not submitted to the Lordship of Jesus, then I'm not in fellowship with them. Our spiritual fellowship is predicated upon obedience to Christ and His will. Now friend, another principle is directly related to that, and it's this. If someone has obeyed the gospel and then gone into a life of sin, has fallen away from the truth, and is living a life of sin and immorality, then I can't be in fellowship with that either. How do we know that? What do I have in common spiritually with a person who has denied the Lord and is now living in sin? We can't have fellowship with evil. The Bible clearly teaches that. Psalm 94 and Habakkuk 1 verse 13. I have nothing in common spiritually with someone who is living a life that is apostatized from the truth. And I, even if I wanted to, I can't be in fellowship with that because we're not sharing the same goals. We don't have in common the same ideals. We're no longer both submitting to the Lordship of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so our fellowship is based on obedience to Christ and the teaching of the gospel. Listen to Philippians chapter 1, verse number 5. Paul says this, for your fellowship, Paul said, I'm thankful to God for you, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Where did Paul say their fellowship was? In the gospel. Someone who's in Christ, living according to the gospel, and remaining faithful. That's where fellowship is located for the Lord's people. But you know, Christians also fellowship Christ 
and His suffering. We have that in common with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that were it not for His suffering, there would be no salvation. Listen to Philippians 3 verse 10. Paul said of Christ that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. Listen to this. And the fellowship of of His sufferings being conformed to His death. How do we fellowship the suffering of Christ? Because if we obey the gospel, we can't deny the fact that that came by His suffering and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3, verse number 12. We also fellowship with other Christians who may suffer. The Bible says in Philippians 4, verse 14, Paul said, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress, the things Paul suffered and the things other Christians suffer, we can have a common bond there because we believe what they're doing is worth suffering for and that Christ is more important than all other things that we may do in this life. Now, as we think about the subject of fellowship and as we try to drive this idea home, the key to Christian fellowship is always based on Christ and His plan of salvation. Listen again to 1 John 1 verse 3. That which Paul said, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. Now listen to this. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. How do we have fellowship this way? By having fellowship this way. My fellowship cannot be with other Christians unless I first have fellowship with God and they're in fellowship with God. Our fellowship, truly Paul said, or John said, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. What do we have in common with God? That we have submitted to His will. That we believe the Bible is His Word. And that His plan of salvation is the way to save that makes people children of God and puts us in His family. Friend, are you in fellowship with God? Have you heard the Word of God? Romans 10, verse 17. Do you believe Jesus is the Savior of the world? John 8, verse 24. Would you repent of things in your life that are not right? Make the good confession before men and do what Jesus said. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. If you'll do those things, you can be in fellowship with God and with other Christians. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.